Hello and welcome to this week's Faith and Friends. We're celebrating the last week of October with you. We have just a few short days until Daylight Savings Times ends. Saturday night, November 5th, or officially Sunday, November 6th at 2 a.m. is the date to set your clocks. Yes, folks, fall is officially here and soon it will be dark. Well, it's Forever. starting to get dark already. And once again, just a reminder, time is a man-made construct and we obligatory <laughs> throw time. I, I just read recently they're adding an, ec an extra second to 2016, further proof that time is just arbitrarily man-made. Mark has this idea of this one world one time. One world, one time. Just get rid of the time zones, put us all in the same time zone. <laughs> It'll bring us together as a global unit. Okay, we better stop him or he'll talk about this for the next 28 minutes and 30 seconds. But is it really 28 minutes and 30 seconds or is it 28 17 and we're just missing those 13 seconds. Oh my goodness. My goodness. Theories. <laughs> well, from darkness to light, that is how some <laughs> describe the change after coming to know Christ. Well, coming up in today's show, the incredible testimony of Josh Weiss, who has experienced that amazing ex experience of receiving a new life in Christ. A local resident, he now lives in Dayton. You don't want to miss his incredible testimony. Also today, a story about a local coach who actually thinks thanks God for his cancer diagnosis and treatment. Because of that diagnosis, his life will never be the same. But first, our scripture, so our lives are never the same, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Certainly that mystery is unveiled to us as we remove the veil from our eyes. And, and God continues to unveil different mysteries of this faith as we get closer to Him, as we read Scripture, as we pray and listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is a journey, and we are so glad to have you uh, on that journey with us, and, and as we can come alongside you on that faith journey as well. It is a journey. It doesn't. You don't just arrive even to the point where you say, okay, I'm, I'm changing now. I recognize that my past is my past and I'm going to the future, but it doesn't just instantly change. You know, it is a journey, but God is with you on that journey all throughout the day, all the way. Well, as we said earlier, we have some incredible testimonial stories coming up later on Faith and Friends, but we want to uh, start the day in honor of World Origami Day. We sure do. There's no better way to start the World Origami Day than start our day right. So I took an unscientific survey via Twitter and Facebook. It's a ball. It's a brooch. Oh, brooch. Our friends and viewers weighed in on an animal, even though they didn't know what they were selecting. And it turns out that you the can't make animal, a paper bear. Is that what you're telling me? You can, but it's just really difficult. And you know, I know I'm you're very box. advanced in things, but I thought we're gonna we want to start something a little more simply. I'm not sure about that. So, a swan is. Did you make this that? Looks kind of like a chicken. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. This was fouls. the winner. The winner was a swan. So people who didn't know what they were voting on voted that you should make a swan. I now, thought we each got our own animal. Well, <laughs> I, the I expert, the I, the expert who just tried to learn how to do this yesterday, is going to teach you. Okay. I found some. Um, I found some some uh, directions on the internet. Okay. Fold. You're not catching it. They're in Spanish. Si. <laughs> you downloaded Spanish instructions for es, es, Esperar. What's it say? Esperar un pesado cuadro de papel. Yo la tenga. Don't you need but like first, a No, no, wait. Or am Before I just you do that, I found this great paper, okay. which is not origami paper, but it's bigger. And big on TV is a good thing. Oh. So you can select your own color of swan. I just flipped that card. What really color good. swan would you like to make? I'd like an orange one. Are there orange swans? Well, in today's day and age <laughs> with pollution, who knows what color swans are? That's a good Syracuse there you go. orange, thank you. All right, how about you? What color swan would you like? I don't want to make a swan. I want to make a bear. He did choose bear. He did choose bear, but Maybe as I was, kind of as I was bear. researching bear further, I discovered that you know, our very, very early um, attempts to make origami animals. Bear might not be the best one. So you, you, you're, you're implying that the ursinine is not the bare minimum for origami? <laughs> Mark is just being difficult. Is he speaking Spanish? I will take blue. <laughs> blue. 
At least. Am I allowed to start folding? Okay, well, do you know what to do first? Uh, I looked at your sheet. And you looked at my sheet. Fold in half, right? Fold, fold in half. half. That's right. I'm going to use my table here. Fold in half. I'll make you know, the yellow one. My lowest grades in elementary school were art class. Oh, always got a needs improvement. Mine were handwriting. We I, never, I never took art class. What? What kind of school did you go to? Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> there was art class in Iowa. I was busy doing yeah, speaking corn class stock, because corn I was stock gonna stock use dolls. speaking for my career and not art. Class Pretty in soon you're gonna recognize that there is a reason I did speech class and not art. I probably should have done art. Okay, open it up. And see all the people. Close the Next doors. Next step so they is all pray. you have to you know what? I think we should move on to our first story. Uh, and this we is will, enthralling television. We will work on this. And then we will show you our progress made a kite. coming up. So we have a story about Coach Dan Otten and a few other high school students. Andy, what are we about to see? Well, back in June, Salina soccer coach Dan Otten underwent surgery to remove a tumor. The six-hour surgery was intense and extensive and was just the start to what would be an extensive recovery process. But during that time, God revealed himself to Coach Otten in a new and very real way. We've really had to learn to not take any of our time that we have to play soccer for granted and just thank God for every moment we have when we're healthy and can play and um, really lean on him to get us through like the tough times. On September 20th, Salinas scored the game-winning goal in the final seconds to beat Wapakoneta, yet the Redskins still wanted to pray with their league rival right after. It was awesome that Walpock does that every game, even though it was such a tough game that we all came together at the end and we could um, pray together and worship together. And the Salina community has rallied together around longtime coach Dan Otten in his battle with cancer. Starting in June when I had the surgery for my cancer, um, looking back on it, it was a kind of a lost summer from a didn't get to go swimming, didn't get on the boats, didn't go on trail runs. You know, I was in hospitals and rehab and all that kind of stuff. But looking back on it now, I told people, I said, this cancer might have been one of the better things, and there's a purpose for everything, one of the better things in my life of teaching me about people, about resiliency, about prayer and support. Everybody knows he's an inspiration. Uh, it's really, it's great to see, have a coach around you constantly that, you know, is a good influence and in teaching you good, like, ethics and good ideas, you know, for being a good athlete and working hard and that kind of stuff. I think anyone who has coached all in, like, knows he's a special person, I think. He teaches like people more about sports. Like he teaches you about your life, and I think um, like he's more than just a track coach or a soccer coach. He really teaches you how to be a better person. The value of prayer and support of the people, the hundreds of people, thousands of people, maybe they've been praying from different churches. I hear, and there's no doubt that's what gets you through it. So I'm pretty positive. Health-wise, I'm doing great. Probably as healthy as I've ever been. My knees don't hurt because I haven't been running for a while. Um, so from a physical end of it, that's what it is. I'm from a mental, I'm better off for it. And so that's where God has a plan for everything. I think this cancer got me on the right path in a mental state. I'm more empathetic, I'm more gung-ho about FCA now. And the way this meeting was today was probably our best meeting in the years I've been involved in FCA. So, you know, sometimes you think your downs are really down in the valleys, but actually it was turned upside down. It was more of a peak for me. I um, mean, the kids are great, my cross-country kids. Um, I can't watch them all the races. I go to all the meets, but I can't move around, so I don't see them a lot of times. But I trust what they're doing, and they know I trust. And their their um, willingness to serve me, take care of me as caretakers, for the things I used to be able to do and thought I could always do. So it's kind of interesting to see how God works just in amazing ways and makes what we think are bad. You know, in His purpose, nothing's bad. Well, truly, God is the healer of all. He can restore anything, whether it be physical health or mental assurance. Now, there is no transforming power stronger than the power of the Almighty God. Temple graduate Josh Weiss is a true testament to that. Though he grew up in a Christian home, it was only recently that he grew into a true relationship with Jesus. Here's his incredible testimony. So, I, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up with Christian parents that really wanted to see me have the best life. They wanted to see me, you know, grow in relationship with God. I 
I started to try to find worth in, in life. I started to actually pursue maybe this whole God thing, but I never really, um, I don't think I ever found it. Growing up in church and having rules, you know, do this and do that or don't do this. I think that's what I saw a relationship with God is like, I just wasn't finding worth in life. I started playing soccer at like a young age, and it was it was fun. I was, you know, people told me I was pretty good. I decided that I wanted to make soccer like my my idol sort of deal. Um, wanted to make it kind of my significance in life. I got on a club soccer team, and that was when I started to feel like I was worth something. People started to acknowledge me as this soccer player who was really good. I was always introduced, this is, you know, this is the guy that played soccer. It felt really good, like every time people would introduce me as that, I felt like I was just like worth something. I started getting talked to by colleges, you know, big schools that, you know, we want you to play here and I started to become really excited. I started thinking that like this, I, maybe professional soccer could actually happen. Maybe I could just escape reality, escape, you know, everything that maybe I was running from in my life and just and just go and I, that would block out all my feelings. I always had one person that it seemed like I could be honest with in my life and I could always just tell her anything and that was my grandma. She always told me that I can do whatever I want if I put my, my heart into it. Um, I got word my grandma was uh, dealing with Alzheimer's and she, you know, they told me that she may not make it very long, much longer and that I should um, say goodbye to her. I was going to um, miss my game and my mom said that you should you know play in the game because that's what grandma would want. She would want you to play because you know she loves you and she loves that you love soccer. And I remember um, leaving that game, going home and, and changing clothes. As I was changing clothes my dad got a call and that she passed and, and I could not, I couldn't like tell her that I loved her, I couldn't tell her how much she meant to me, and I like, I guess I felt like I missed my shot. I don't know how, I just kept, kept playing soccer, and not, not in three, not more than three weeks after that, I was playing in a game, and I blew up my knee, and that was just like, right after, like right after another, I just saw my, it felt like, seriously, I know it sounds crazy, but it felt like my world just like ended, uh, it felt like everything was just crumbling. The people that were always giving me validation in my life or worth just, it was kind of like they disappeared. It was, it was a really hard time in my life. I just remember wanting nothing to do with God. I wanted nothing to do with people. And I remember like feeling like a lot of, there's a lot of hate, I guess, towards life, towards a God that I think my whole life, if I had any relationship with him, was based on outcomes, was based on what I got, what, uh, what my reality was. If it wasn't good, it was God's fault. If it was good, it was all me. I'm returning to, whether it be girls, every single weekend, just trying to give me a feeling of significance, like worth, love, um, a temporal love. I remember going to, whether it be alcohol or you know, maybe drug use, just here and there, just trying to escape, get a high to, to feel the worth that I, that I was searching for. I was addicted to pornography um, and just was like turning to girl after girl. Like I would just wake up feeling so much more empty than I was in that moment that next morning waking up after being with a girl. And there's times in there where contemplating, I guess, not, I don't know, I don't wanna say suicide, but it was just like, is this even worth it? Like, is this life? Like, what am, everyone's searching for something, like worth it. Everyone's searching to feel this emptiness. And I keep like making myself more empty is what it felt like. I had a representation of God that he was disgusted with me. I just didn't feel worthy, and that was part of my turning away. It wasn't that I like made this decision of, you know, I just don't want this because it's not cool. It's like, man, it's like I believe, but I don't believe that I'm good enough. There's no way that I, God can love me. There's no way that um, 
that I can be his child and be called good and be called holy. <laughs> About a year and a half ago, um, my dad who raised me in the church kind of molded me and handed, handed down this religion to me. He came out as atheist to me and it hurt, it hurt for some reason even though I wasn't considering myself a father of Jesus, it still hurt me. Um, to know that someone that raised me that my whole life, it almost felt like my life was a lie for someone that grounded my life in something that was so important to, to reject it. And in that time, I don't know what caused me to do it, but it caused me when I was feeling so empty. I, first, I like picked up the Bible and I started to read it for myself where I like put down everything that I was taught. And when I picked up this book and put down all those, those preconceived ideas, um, I like fell in love with Jesus. I don't, I can't explain it. Um, it was though I saw a man that would go to the outcast, um, who at that time I was seeing myself as an outcast, who I was hiding from everyone who I was. Um, I was hiding from God, like, like he didn't already know or something. Um, I guess a year and a half ago is when I fully decided to commit my life to God and surrender everything and it felt like at that time when I did that um, that like all, all this shame all this regret all this unworthiness it felt like he was just like looking down at me and like holding out his hand he said I've been waiting for you to just admit to me just admit who you are don't hide like quit hiding I still love you still want you. I've always wanted you. It's you who have, who have created this idea in your head that I don't want you. And um, when I did that, when I was just honest, I felt like this thing has been lifted off my back. When I found him, I couldn't reject him because he loved me no matter what. He loved me in my hurt, my sin, in my pain. No more shame. <laughs> no more regret. Uh, no more hiding. I'm not going to hide from God because he already knows and he's the only one that gives me my worth. Powerful, powerful things. I, I'm so grateful that he was able to share that with us. I, I'm sure we've all been into that place before. We've gone in that, that cycle of shame. Uh, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory. And uh, some powerful testimony from Josh that it's never too late. It's, there's no point where we can reach where God won't reach down and, and bring us back to him. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Well, as our guys continue their attempts to make incredible swans, did, you can put the neck up. Neck? What neck? Mine doesn't have a neck either. It's an airplane, right? We're making yeah. airplanes? <laughs> October 29th is National <laughs> Stroke Awareness Day. Hmm. Look. Rah! <laughs> did you catch well, today that? we're going to take some time to help you understand the symptoms and risks of strokes. A stroke can affect men and women in very different ways, but a surprising new survey is now showing just how unaware most women are when it comes to strokes. Clark Powell reports from the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Four leaders. Working as a critical care nurse, Kelly Earlywine is trained to spot even the most subtle signs of problems in her patients. It's something she rarely misses in them, but recently failed to recognize in herself. Kelly was suffering from migraines, dizziness, and even tremors, all of which she thought were just signs of stress. These symptoms started, but never would I have contributed at my age of 32 of having a stroke. But that's just what happened, and doctors say Kelly is not alone. Women do not think that they're going to have a stroke. They think of it as a men's disease. Dr. Diana Green Chandos is a neurologist who says women have unique risks and symptoms when it comes to stroke, but many don't know it. Things like pregnancy and migraines can make a stroke more likely. But a new national survey of women released by the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center found that only 11% of women could identify a list of female specific risks. And 9 out of 10 didn't know that women often have hiccups during a stroke. 
Knowing the very first signs of a stroke is crucial because doctors say there is only a three hour window to get to a hospital for possible life saving medicine. You have to know when you're having a stroke. You have to recognize that it's a stroke and you have to get to the emergency room and receive the medication. Kelly was lucky. She had her stroke at the hospital and got help immediately. But she says she's learned that she should have listened to her body all along. Get checked out. Get lab work done. You know, tell your doctor some of your symptoms. I want to be here for my family. I want to be here for my little girl. At Ohio State's Wexner Medical Center, this is Clark Powell reporting. We continue with more stroke awareness as there's another step beyond knowing the signs actually getting checked. Another survey indicates young people are more likely to ignore signs of stroke and would not go to the ER. Clark Powell talks with one young woman who thankfully did go to the emergency room. The symptoms Jennifer Riley experienced seemed like nothing. Numbness in her hand periodically, followed by a bad headache a few weeks later. In fact, Jennifer might have ignored her symptoms if not for a coworker who insisted she go to the hospital, where she was stunned by her diagnosis. When the doctor told me that I had had a stroke at age 27, I almost didn't believe him. I almost thought that this, this could not be possible. Not only is it possible, it's happening more often. Since the mid 90s, strokes in patients under the age of 45 have shot up as much as 53%. And all too often, young patients react just like Jennifer. We may think that these symptoms may be mild or due to some other medical problem or nothing at all. So we tend to delay and not come in immediately, but that is, uh, that's a real problem. Dr. David Leviskind of Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center diagnosed Jennifer. He says she's lucky she got help in time because most young people may not. In fact, in a new national survey by UCLA, those under 45 were given the symptoms of a stroke and asked what they would do in the first three hours. Only about one out of three said they would be very likely to go to the hospital. A staggering 73% said they were likely to just wait to see if they got better, a delay that could prove costly. Timely treatment for stroke is probably more important than for almost any other medical problem there is. The brain is very sensitive uh, to a lack of blood flow or bleeding. Uh, and uh, the consequences can be absolutely devastating. Doctors say everyone should know the signs of a stroke and act fast. If the face droops and arm weakens or speech changes, it's time to call 911. Go and check it out. Ask the questions um, because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here. At Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center, this is Clark Powell reporting. Dr. Trudy Pieper is joining us to talk about keeping breasts healthy, preventive, proactive things that can be done to help us prevent some things down the road. Absolutely, and your point about breast cancer is so important here, Jennifer. It is the lead, leading cause of, of breast cancer for women is, for cancer mm. is breast cancer. So we, as women, really need to be thinking about, you know, how can we prevent breast cancer? The best way is making sure that we have our lymphatic system working well. And the lymph glands, um, there are more, there's more fluid in our lymph glands than any place else in our mm. body. And we tend not to think about that. And at, between each cell is a fluid. And it, so the lymph is outside of the cells and it acts as a liaison between the cells and the blood. And the lymph manufactures the majority of our white blood cells, which fight off all the invaders that come into our body our viral and bacterial infections. And the lymph, it's really the, the transportation system for waste. Hmm. And it pulls the, the waste out of our body into the blood where it takes it to the liver, the kidneys, and the colon then to get rid of. So a healthy breast depends upon the cleansing action of our lymph system. Anybody who has had a cancer scare or who has dealt with breast cancer has definitely heard about the lymph nodes yes. or any sort of cancer. And my mother is a cancer survivor. And I remember we were praising God back those years ago, knowing that the cancer hadn't gotten into her lymph nodes. So here we have this lymph system that um, doesn't pump like a circulatory system, but yet needs to, be, needs to be filtered and flushed through. Right, and since we don't have a, a pump like the heart, and circulatory. The way we flush that out is the movement is when we move, our lymphs move. So for the best way for you to clean out your lymph system is you have to move your body. Now a mini tramp is probably the absolute positively best mm. way if you're, you're bouncing, mm -hmm. then that moves the lymph through. But there are other ways. Brisk walking four times a week for 20 minutes will create healthier breasts. Drinking plenty of water, six glasses a day will actually help you flush those toxins through your kidneys and get rid of them. 
increasing your fiber to at least 20 grams a day will remove the waste through the colon. But interesting enough, you know, women are always thinking about their weight. Right. If you're doing 20 grams of fiber, you're also going to lose weight. So mm. There's another added benefit <laughs> to making sure you need fiber in your system. Broccoli, which is a cruciferous vegetable, has been found as the number one vegetable to prevent breast cancer. So adding some broccoli at least every week to Does your diet. Does that mean broccoli with cheese sauce? Or should it just be uh, steamed broccoli it's or raw steam, broccoli? A steamed broccoli, raw broccoli, maybe with a little dip or a little butter on it. But yes, the, you need to keep it in its richest form so the nutrients are still there. And then finally, um, limiting your carbs. Uh, this is one that's really important. I see a lot uh, today with my patients. Um, particularly those with breast cancer, they ate a lot of carbs, which mm -hmm. includes sugar, and mm -hmm. sugar feeds cancer. So women who eat more carbs are twice as likely to get breast cancer wow. than those who do not. Wow. So cut back on your carbs, your pastas, your breads, um, anything that is a carbohydrate, <laughs> which is a complex carbohydrates, are, are just as bad as simple sugars to do that. And your final one on your list is your favorite. You Everybody hear about knows. it all the time. <laughs> green tea. <laughs> Three glasses of green tea a day will protect against estrogen dominant cancer in mm. your lymph system. That's important. I mean, we hear about green tea for so many important reasons, but that's a real poignant fact that it I would is. think would convince a lot of people, a lot of women, to drink green tea. And the green tea should be used with stevia, a little tiny bit of honey, but again, we want to make it so that you're not. Uh, adding carbs, sugar, mm. to your diet. So try to learn that without sugar in it. All right, so ladies, you heard it. More movement means healthier breasts. Maybe you do have a mini trampoline and you can do some jumping on that every day, but a lot of us don't have one of those. We've got a lot of other very good, easy things to do. Brisk walking, plenty of water, increased fiber, eat your broccoli, limit your carbs, and three glasses of green tea a day. Of course, if you ever have questions about this or want to learn more, you can contact Dr. Trudy Pieper at Phoenix Wellness Center in Johnstown, Ohio. You can look her up online as well at phoenixwellnessforyou.com and there you can see the phone number right on your screen. Thank you, Dr. Trudy. Car question for you now. Do you have an older car that still runs well and could be a blessing to others? Are you thinking of purchasing a new vehicle and your current trade-in will bring you low trade-in value? Donate your car to TV44. You'll get a tax deduction and TV44 will be blessed financially. We are already accepting vehicles for the 2017 auction. For more information about donating a vehicle to TV44 or selling a vehicle and donating the proceeds, call 419-339-4444. Ask for Jennifer or Kevin. You can also email your questions to contact at WTLW.com. Hey, how you doing? I think it's kind hey. of like a wow. Thing. Hey, that, that looks impressive. pretty nice. I think it looks better than this one. Mine has a broken neck. <laughs> Can you rip origami? Is that allowed? To mm -hmm. kind of enhance the tail. I, I think some origami people at home right now are just might be screaming at you. He needs some uh, aerodynamic push, so I'm helping him out. This is a great idea, Jennifer. <laughs> I did not create World <laughs> Origami Days. I'm just celebrating it. And I'm encouraging you to <laughs> celebrate. celebrate. And guess what? It you have a different <laughs> definition of celebration than the rest of us. <laughs> but this continues through November. So just think, if Andy oh, wow. practiced every day until <laughs> mid-November, there's some, you never know what could happen. At least it's orange. We have a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, coming up uh, now, taking place now for the next <laughs> week, only World Origami Days lasts for a few weeks yet, but still only about a week to go this in the, the, John, last week. the John Reed Leadership Award yeah. nominations. That's right. You can go online, WOSN.TV, uh, to nominate a coach, high school, JV, or ninth grade, varsity or assistant, and tell us a, a story of how uh, that coach is making an impact. Just got a submission this week from a son nominating his dad. A really yeah. special story there. Uh, but we want to hear these stories, and the deadline is this week. So get those in, WOSN.TV. Go on John Reed Leadership Award link at the top. And we will unveil the winner uh, November the 15th at our uh, night over at Lima First Assembly of God Church with Dave Wilson, the Detroit Lions Chapel. So always a special process. And if we have people at home who are saying, I'm just not computery, that's not me, but I want to nominate, can they call? Should they call for Ben? Should they call for you? I would say drop off a letter. Drop off a letter. The studio. Okay. We or mail it for that matter. Well, if it gets here in time. 
yes, the mail would work. Well, that award nominations remind me of the importance of praying for the coaches mm. in the area. These individuals are mentors and can have really strong influence on the next generation. We also want to encourage you to keep praying for our elections and our country. We are down to the days, almost single digit. Remember, it's not the Republican Party, or the Democrat Party that's going to make our, our country what it needs to be. It's Jesus Christ. And before we go, let's take one final look at our scripture, Mark. Our scripture for today comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Something to keep in mind this week as we leave you now, and we'll see you next time here on Faith and Friends.